Okay guys, welcome to another They Did What. This week I'm taking a look at uh, Classic Software House Access Software. <coughs> Excuse me now, Access Software, they were a very, very early video game, uh, video game company established in the States. Um, looking at the Wikipedia, it was a chap called Christopher, Chris Jones, um, he was a founding member of Access Software along with Bruce Carver and his brother Roger and indeed he remained its CFO until the company was sold to Microsoft in 1999. Now if you're an old head like myself, um, you know, been playing games from the very early days, the, the titles will be very very familiar to you. Stuff like Beachhead, Leaderboard, Raid Over Moscow, stuff like that. They weren't a particularly prolific uh, company, I have to say. Um, I mean, they didn't make that many games. Um, I know their games were released by US Gold in the, in the UK. Um, one interesting thing is, as you can tell, I like to play sort of SID music over uh, this uh, when you're looking at the, the sort of the adverts and titles. But there's actually a lot of their games, like Raid Over Moscow. Beachhead, Leaderboard, they didn't have any music, there was no music at all, so that's why I'm actually having to play the same, uh, well sorry, Beachhead 2 is one of the, the tunes, um, I'm actually playing the same music from one of their games called Mean Streets, which is playing just now, obviously Beachhead 2 and Scrolls of Abarodon or something I think it's called, but uh, yeah, their games are excellent as we'll soon see, so I will be quiet and let you just enjoy the adverts. Okay, to kick things off, this is 10th Frame, a 10-pin bowling simulator. And this one is on the Atari ST, utilises the mouse. Now, this game wasn't uh, released on the Amiga, I certainly can't find a copy of it anywhere. <coughs> it was released on the 8-bits, uh, it says also on the Atari ST. There's different levels. Kids means that the ball automatically goes in a straight line. Amateur, I think, you've, you can put spin in it, whatever, but and then professional is more difficult. But So you move, you press the fire button, mouse button. Ooh, that's looking good. Ah, bollocks. Want to go. Now you can hear the uh, the digitised speech, not digitised speech, the digitised sound in this version. I did play it a wee bit, but I did find it, oops, made an arse of that one. I did find it, it's, I think it's a game really, you, need to, you want to play with friends. You know, playing it as a sort of solo game, you would get bored, I think, fairly quickly. I know I did anyway, I didn't. It wasn't a game I played particularly much. It was certainly first one of the first sort of sports simulators I think that I ever saw. No doubt if this game was made now you would have other people playing in other lanes and that kind of stuff, but yeah, I mean I think it's it's fairly accurate. 
for what um, what they were trying to do. In most of the games from Access were programmed by us as Roger and Bruce Carver, they were brothers. Now I know, and I, can't, I don't know what one it was, one of them's actually sadly passed away, I think he died a few years ago, but that's Atari ST one, um, this is the Commodore 64 one, this was the one that I, I bought and played back in the day. And graphically, there's not a whole lot to choose between between that and the Atari ST one. You'll find that the sound, obviously, the the, the C64 one wouldn't have the digitised sound. But the actual graphics <coughs> and animation is really spot on. <laughs> it's more kind of an explosion sound rather than the sort of balls getting knocked over sound. But yeah, I mean that, that, the C sixty four version is pretty impressive. The animation's excellent. If you look at the guy's legs as he's kind of walking up, this use of shadow, very clever. Oh, am I going to get that? Oh, ah, I didn't realise there was another one tucked in behind it. But yeah, like I was saying, it's not a game that <clears throat> it's not a game that you would really want to play for any length of time because it's just you, you know, it's just like practicing all the time. I don't think there's any option for a uh, computer controlled opponent. You know, so you, you couldn't really play a tournament unless you were actually playing against uh, other people. What the hell happened there? I don't know why the ball suddenly jumped across, but... I know in the States, uh, 10 pin bowling is way more popular than it is in the UK. I mean, it it went... it had a real surge in popularity, sort of, in the 90s. Um, that was the C64 and this is like the Spectrum one we're looking at. Yeah, it became very, very popular in the sort of 90s. There was a lot of bowling alleys and that, there was mega bowls and things like that opening up. Ten pin as well I think they were called. I don't think they're as popular now. There is actually a ten pin bowling alley up, up the road for me right enough but yeah I don't think it's as popular but yeah Spectrum one, um, nice use of red. Whoa what a shot. Now I've got to say this is, Spectrum one is a demo. <laughs> I wish I wish I had just played that shot but I'm not but yeah, the the graphics are nice. Yeah, the colours not the nicest, but again, you'll see the animation is pretty spot on. Really, really nice. No, we're not going to see any more of it. So anyway, that's tenth frame. This one is called Heavy Metal on the Commodore sixty four. Now, <coughs> this was actually a later game. This came out about nineteen ninety ninety one something like that. Now I'm actually just letting the Letting it, it's a demo mode. You can see their press space to start, so this is just a demo mode. So I thought I'll, I'll just let it go through because I did have a wee shot to play, and I really didn't have any idea what I was doing. It, it was going through some sort of strange setup thing. So it looks just like a, a basic crosshair shoot 'em up, almost like an Operation Wolf. But instead of shooting uh, people, you're shooting aeroplanes and tanks and that kind of stuff. Now there was a version of this for the Commodore Amiga, I think, as well. There seems to be a lack of sound in the demo, unfortunately, other than the shooting sound. But yeah, I mean, it's it's. It's nice graphics. Probably be quite boring, I think, eventually. But that's heavy metal. That's on the C64. Right, this is the original leaderboard. This is on the Amstrad. It's always interesting to see the way the 8 bits actually drew the graphics. You, you see it drawing the wee shapes and then it would fill it in. I've got to say that Amstrad is way more capable of better graphics. You know, the Amstrad has got a really excellent colour palette, better than the, the Spectrum in Commodore 64. 
and yet they've chosen the guy's top to be green could they not have gone for a different colour? But nice animation, uh, I mean the original leaderboard it really, <clears throat> the games, golf games had gone before, there was Nick Faldo plays the Open um, there were some some really really bad golf games, golf games were no, never really that approachable until leaderboard leaderboard came along with this immense graphic uh, graphic technique you know basically wherever wherever you you know you, you you plant the ball the graphics will draw the viewpoint so it was it was pretty cutting edge stuff the only thing that uh, people the sort of criticism of the original uh, leaderboard was there were no trees you were basically just playing in straightforward greens the whole time. Well, made an of that. But then, as we'll see, later versions did rectify it. But, yeah, leaderboard, to my mind, was the first game to introduce the power bar, where you, you press the power bar, the button to start it, and then you stop it. And the same way when you're actually swinging a club, you start it, you stop the power, then you can then decide whether you want to hook or fade the ball. And that that uh, approach has been used even in games now like uh, I was going to say Tiger Woods uh, Golf, it's, it's not not be Tiger Woods anymore, not sure who makes it for EA Sports but so that was the Amstrad one, this is the, the original one, this is the Commodore 64 now I've got to say this looks the dog's bollocks it really does and for a 3D type game, it's actually pretty quick at filling it in. Yeah, you see there, I mean, the guy, the golfer, he's got you know, different coloured trousers. And even the, the shadow again of his leg as he takes his shot. That is mega impressive. Like the 10 pin bowling one, there are different levels um, of skill. You've got kids, amateur, and professional. Kids will hit the ball, you don't get affected with the wind and you don't have any power or snap to worry, sorry you only have the power to worry about, you don't have the snap determines whether you hook or slice the ball which means the ball either goes left or right. If you're playing with kids it always goes straight ahead. <coughs> I think advanced doesn't use wind but it uses the snap whereas the professional does all of them. So I'm putting downhill and it's running slightly to the right is that in? Is that in? Have I given that enough? Oh. But I played this game a lot. Really, really tremendous game. As I said, it just revolutionised golf games. There we go, cup in! The funny thing is... <laughs> It's it's almost a it's a fictional golf course because what golf course would you get islands like that you know with water in between you there's no way of uh, of actually getting across unless you had a boat. And it was one of these things, yep, yeah, you had to get to know the strength. What was that in the water? Yep, there we go, you heard a splash, and you saw a wee bit of splash. So that's uh, the Commodore 64 one. This is the Spectrum one. And again, the Spectrum one's nice and, nice and fluid. Again, they've gone for a sort of like a monochrome uh, colour for the, the golfer. But it's it's quite quick. I think it's actually the quickest 8-bit when it comes to drawing the graphics. That's a good shot, I think. Not quite as near as I thought it was going to be. There's a slight delay in drawing the guy, oddly. 
But yeah, leaderboard. I says it, it's the games, the golf games before leaderboard were pretty rubbish. You know, they weren't that playable. But this one, it was almost like an open 3D engine. It could draw the ball. It could draw the golf course from wherever you landed. So it was quite kind of. It was quite out there, you know, for 1985-86 when it came out. And I've just missed a simple putt. So that is that is the original leaderboard. Now this one is leaderboard tournament. This is on Atari ST. That's going to the left a wee bit. You can see the 16-bit machine is a bit quicker at drawing the graphics. So yeah, it's it's taken the 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 same idea from the original, but this one, I mean, it's more courses. Basically, these, I mean, there was le there was leaderboard, there was leaderboard uh, tournament. Was it leaderboard professional? I think it was it called. I can't remember exactly. We'll I'll come to it. Um, and basically, it was the same game, same game engine, just more courses. But you can see here the tournament one. It introduced uh, bunkers for the first time, or I think bunkers may have been in the other one. It had bunkers and it also had trees as well. So this was the real forefather to the golf games that you get to play now. Um, this is still super playable. Still an amazing game in the 8 bits and 16 bit. So I would definitely consider Bruce and Roger Carver as being the forefathers of the sort of the, the video golf game. Because the control methods haven't changed that much. Now you use the, the analogue stick to, to sort of do the, you know, to swing the club, but they really, really started, they got the control system in place, which other games copied. So I'm putting uphill and the hill is running down to the sort of south southwest. Oh, that should have been in. <laughs> I need to tap it here, don't overcook it. And I've made an arse ship. Yeah, anyway, that's Leaderboard Tournament Edition. That was in the Tar ST, that one. Right, this one is Mean Streets on the Commodore 64. Now, I've never heard of this game before. Um, this is the first time I've actually played it. And I really have no idea what I'm trying to do here. I mean, I'm, you can see I'm, I'm trying to move with a joystick. And, you know, there is a bit of movement going on here, but... I'm guessing you can see the sort of like the joystick thing in the centre of the screen. I'm a guessing there is uh, possibly a like a thrust button or something. I really don't know. Um, I guess I could have actually looked for footage of the game elsewhere, but yeah. So I don't know too much about this one other than it did come out on the, the C64 and also the Amiga. But I have really no idea what I'm trying to do here. I mean, it is, this is the joystick is moving, but and you can see dials moving as well, but I've really got no idea. I'm guessing there's probably keys or something. It looks kind of like a flight simulator. So, yeah, sorry, I can't really let you see this one, guys. It's called Mean Streets, and that is the C64 one. Right, this next one, this was one of the very first games I ever played in the Commodore 64. This is called Neutral Zone. <laughs> Blimey, talk about taking me back in time. Um, looking at this game now, it almost looks like it was written in basic. Um, I mean, the Commodore 64 font, I always remember thinking this is uber impressive, but when you see it now, it's just basically simple sprites moving across the screen. You see there it tells you whether the enemy is to the left or right, so you look at that and you just basically move. I always thought this was quite impressive looking, I mean really the the, the sort of firing is quite impressive, but yeah, I think this was one of their first games. Uh, 
But I guess for a, an early game, you know, the presentation's quite nice, quite decent sound. The graphics aren't bad. You know, you need to, when you look at some of the, the games that were out back in, you know, the early 80s, um, <laughs> this wasn't actually half bad. So, there you go, you're a winner, it's using user-defined graphics. That was basically it. That was a neutral zone. <laughs> right, this one is Ollie's Follies. Now, I've never played this game before. Um, I do remember seeing it. Oh, I have got no idea what I've got. Is that a cap? Or is that a, a turbine? Or is it a ball? Or is it a bit of baking dough? I have no idea what that is that you've got in your head. Oh, that's not a good idea, I don't think. So you pick up that thing. I'm assuming you need that to, you need to pick them up to advance to the next level. Or do you use that to kill the robots? I have really no idea. I like the animation of the robots, I mean it's quite simple. Right, I'm on to level 2. It's a game I remember, I remember vividly the name of it, All These Follies, I mean it's quite distinctive. Um, I remember it being released by US Gold, obviously published by Access Software, but never actually played it. Well, I think this may have been released for the Atari 8-bit as well, I'm not 100% sure. <coughs> Need to get this wee guy moving. You can bugger off. I've got the same number phones my mobile every day from somebody from Derby. I don't know anyone from Derby, so I just don't answer it. Ooh, is that fans? I think, is it? Yeah, they're kind of blowing me all the time. <laughs> That's actually not a bad wee game. I mean, it's it's not... I wouldn't say it's up there with uh, Minor 2049 or Bounty Bob Strikes Back, but that's actually quite a playable little game. So, yeah, I'll need to, I'll need to check that one out at some point. So that's all these follies, and that was on the C64. Yeah, Raid Over Moscow. Oh dear, yep, it's just, this game seems quite appropriate in the current political landscape. Um, you know, I remember playing this back in the day and being genuinely worried about tensions and that, and you know, it's uh, it's settled down for a while and things seem to have been going back to worse again, but anyway, enough, we're not going to get into a political debate. Um, this was quite a controversial game at the time for obvious reasons. This is the C64 one. Now, the idea of the game is Russia have launched a nuclear missiles at certain um, U sorry, US cities. You can see there they've launched a site from Minsk and it's heading for Atlanta. Now, because this is a multi-layer, a multi-layered, well, I suppose it is a multi-layered game, I've just let, I'm just recording the demo of the game because I'd have been there all day trying to, in fact, I wouldn't have even got to show you all the levels because it, it would take me all day to try and do that. So you can see here, it's, it's I think there's about four or five, four or, I can just see the ice cream van outside and it's pushing me rain. Yeah, there's about four or five different levels, this is the, the second last one, you're trying to blow up robots from the Kremlin. <laughs> yeah, it was quite, quite a political game at the time. Now this one here, I think you're, I can't remember what you're doing, you're throwing discs to try and destroy the, is it a lunar reactor, not the lunar, the nuclear reactor, but this little robot tries to defend, it tries to bounce them back, or no, in fact, no, sorry, you're trying to destroy the robot, um, quite a difficult game, but yeah, that is, it's an excellent game, it's a bit, ooh, you know, but uh, anyway, that was Raid Over Moscow, 
This one is, this is on the Atari 800. This is called Scrolls of Abaddon. And the wee sprite looks quite similar to the Ollie's Follies one. Now, what you're doing here is you're actually collecting whatever it is to whom, whomever. Whomever, that's not a word, is it? Whoever, not whomever. <laughs> um, yeah, I gems left. What you're trying to do here is pick up a gem, but when you walk over the gem in a direction, you'll see there a wee arrow is deployed in the ground, and it means that you can only go over that arrow in the direction it's pointing, so you can't basically go back the way in an arrow. If that makes sense. You've got to try and collect all the gems. Then you move over that thing. And then it transfers you to another level. Again, this is one I've never heard of. One thing I like about the Atari 8-bit, if you look at the, the top where it says the score, you've got that lovely kind of pink graduation of colour. You know, that's something that... The, I don't think any of the other 8-bits uh, could have done. Possibly the Amstrad. The Amstrad did have a nice colour palette, but certainly the Spectrum and Commodore 64 couldn't do that. I mean, the, the Atari had some lovely colour. It was a very, very underrated computer, unfortunately. It just, it was before, it was before its time. It was ahead of its time, and it was uh, <coughs> way too expensive. You know, something like five, six hundred pounds when it first came out, which was beyond the, the purse of most people. Right, moving on. Why can't I move on? Well, maybe there's another gem I still have to collect. No, it says gems left zero. I've got no idea. Anyway, that's Scrolls of Abaddon. That was on the Atari 800. Right, the first beachhead we're going to look at is the best as far as I'm concerned. Again, this is on the demo. This is the C64. Now, annoyingly, any time I try and emulate this game, you always get that graphical corruption. See, just above the, the player bit at the bottom. Yeah, you can see that the demo is particularly pants at the game. I love this game. The sound is one of the it's, it's one of these games that's got the best sound I think of most games that I've ever heard of. It's just phenomenal. I mean, wait till you hear the sound of the aeroplanes going overhead. I could stop shooting for a second. Yeah, that's just. It's just an amazing sound. It's quite a simplistic game, this actually. <coughs> it's really what four or five little mini games. You would call them mini games if it came out in a current console. But collectively, it just they came together so well. But I say the graphics and sound for me in this game are just awesome. In this level, you're trying to take out the enemy fleet. And when you fire a, a missile, it'll tell you whether you've landed too long or short. And so you've then got to adjust the gun to try and sink the boat. So this is the third level. Yep, this is the third level. Do they seriously, I don't know if you can hear the ice cream van outside, do they seriously think kids are going to go out and buy an ice cream when it is about one degrees in Baltic and pushing my rain? Seriously. Um, right, this is uh, the next level. This is a tank one. I mean, the <coughs> technically this particular level I think is probably about the weakest. The graphics are a bit rubbish. There's no animation to speak of <laughs> um, in the tank. This is the final level you're trying to destroy. You've got to hit these little white targets and if you hit them all before the big gun takes you out you destroy the gun and it's game over. So that is the C64 one. Moving on, this is the Spectrum one. Very similar but it just doesn't have the uh, it's not got the graphical finesse and certainly it's not got the sound of the, the C64 one. I mean, it's a, it's a nice attempt, but I'm 
call me biased, but uh, you know, I just think the C sixty four one is uh, eclipses all other ones. I mean, the animation's pretty good, but the sound to me was it was really the one of the sort of the, the best bits about the game. You know, has it dated well? Probably not. You know, is that a game you'd want to play now? If you put that in front of kids now, they would probably wouldn't be interested in playing it. But then, probably kids wouldn't be interested in playing any, even the best uh, 8-bit game. Well, I'll say one thing about the Spectrum one, at least it's got moving uh, tracks in the tank. Which is an improvement, although I'm not overly keen in the use of pink, pink blocks. <laughs> but you've basically got eight tanks, so you've got eight goes to try and take out all the little targets on the, the big gun at the end. They're rather shamefully, being a big fan of Beachhead, I've only ever actually completed it on the very easiest beginner level, which is actually quite pathetic when you think about it. And you can see that the computer is absolutely hopeless, it's not even attempting to move. So anyway, that's Beachhead, and that, that was the Spectrum one. Right, this is <coughs> a game called Echelon. It sounds like a shoot em up. Area map on. <laughs> now this is uh, this is actually Area Pete. Map off. Yep, I've got no idea what I'm doing here. This is on PC DOS. It's running under whatever it is that I emulator thing you need to use to run DOS games. Um it looks quite nice. It looks like a kind of proper uh, flying activated. flying sort of scanner type thing. But I've really got no idea what I'm actually trying to destroy or whatever. Cannon. Got to say, I'm loving the loving the graphics. It kind of it's kind of star Midile sort of glider. Activated. Nice graphics. This is also Enemy available for alert. the. Uh, it's also available for the C64. But I couldn't get it working. It's a, it's a multi-disc, and I could not for the life of me figure out how to flip the disc in an emulator, so that's why I'm showing you the PC DOS one. HDAP activated. Oh, I've got no idea what's going on here. I'm just using the mouse, it's actually quite quite a nice control. The graphics are very smooth as well, which is excellent. I think this was a later game again, I think this was kind of late 80s, something like that. So that was Echelon. This one is Heavy Metal. Ah, in fact, I, I showed you the C64 one. Um, this is Heavy Metal on the Amiga. Again, it's quite a... It's quite a simplistic sort of crosshair shooter. It's basically Operation Wolf, but with planes and tanks. Graphics are fairly basic looking. What the hell? Now you can probably tell this is a, a demo. <laughs> I'm not actually playing it. <laughs> because trying to play these games in two minutes something doesn't work. You can get away with a, an arcade game but not a game like that so... Yeah, that is heavy metal and that is on the Amiga. Right, last game guys, <coughs> this is Beachhead 2, and this is the Spectrum. And that sound would probably get on my nerves. Now this game is a landmark game on the Commodore 64. Um, when it was released, Zap magazine just went absolutely apeshit, I think it got a gold medal, and it was justly deserved. Um, the animation on the, the guys is just mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. When you think about, 
you know, how pixely um, 8-bit machines are, and you see something like this running is incredible. And I've got to say, the Spectrum 1 looks nice as well, but the C64 one, again, like the original Beachhead, the sound is to die for. But anyway, I'm talking about the Spectrum one. Um, graphically wise, this is really, really pretty. So you get to play as Allies or the Dictator. I think you could pick what level you played. Never liked this level. You're basically trying to uh, <coughs> ensure the little guy that's walking from left to right gets a safe passage. He's got to try and cross the courtyard safely and you've got all manner of people dropping traps and tanks trying to shoot them, tanks trying to run over them, you've got a wee guy that comes out the ground and plants a landmine and so you're basically controlling the gun at the bottom here and you've got to try and shoot the, the various uh, enemies I mean the wee guy at the top there has just dropped a thing on top of his head which is virtually impossible to, to avoid I've got to say the sound, the sound of that gun would get on my nerves big style. <laughs> it's quite grating. There you go, he's going to get killed with that thing again. Oh, he missed. I'm going to try and destroy that little car thing. There's a tank coming. In fact, that tank thing, the other thing's not going to get him, so I need to worry about the tank. Oh, he's going to step in that. Nah, too late. Yeah, now this is the Amstrad one. Ah, right, okay. When you're am controlling the helicopter, you basically, uh, if you go down too low, when you drop them, they automatically die. So you've got to retain a bit of height. Now, colour-wise, this is pretty good. I mean, this... You could be forgiven thinking this was a C64 one. I always thought, <coughs> as a, a game, I didn't think that Beachhead 2 was that good. Um, again, you know, it was a collection of mini-games. I mean, as a technical demo, it's outstanding, the stuff that it did, you know, it introduced speech, the animation, the sound, you know, digitised sound and what have you, it was incredible, but I just didn't, I didn't really, I wasn't a big fan of the games themselves, some of the levels were fun, I mean, this particular level here I found very, very frustrating to play. So that's, that's the Amstrad one, uh, I'm only letting you see the first level on it, let's move on to the C64 one. Yeah, you can see the slightly toned down colour. Now again, I'm not actually playing this, I'm just letting the letting the the computer do a demo. Because, you know, because of multi stages, I said I'd be there all day trying to record all these. Now once all the troops have been deployed behind the first wall you see a wee white dot appears on top of the wall, that basically means you've got a troop behind it. So once all the troops have been dropped, they'll then move, try and run to the next wall. Yeah, graphically, it's a masterpiece, this game. But I wasn't overly keen. I thought I thought out the, the three kind of... You know, Beachhead is a great game. Um, Raid or Moscow's great, but I think this was probably the weakest of the lot. Look at the graphics. I'm hit. <laughs> Listen to the sound. <laughs> Incredible. I mean, they've even got, it's not just sound, it's speech, they've even got feeling, you know, it really sounds like a guy screaming when he's been... <laughs> I think it was uh, the company that, they used the same uh, speech technology that they used for Impossible Mission. 
And there's one more guy at the top there. Now these guys will try and advance up. Oh, he's just ran like hell across to the side. You know, look at the animation for him climbing the wall there. Just brilliant. Now I think depending on how many men you safely get to the bottom determines there's a guy trying to throw the bomb. A grenade determines how many lives you get in the next stage. Right now this is a level we we're looking at in the spectrum. Again, yeah, I'm not a I'm not a fan of this level at all. I just think it's a bit rubbish. It's probably the weakest one out of a lot of them. You can consider the other ones are all heavily sort of war game esque type thing. This one just felt a bit. Meh. It felt like it had just been added in to try and boost the levels, basically, if that makes any sense. Always found either trying to control the wee guy walking was difficult and trying to shoot the stuff was difficult. Right, this is the, the second last level. This is quite a nice little, I'll be sort of basic shoot 'em up. You've got to control the uh, height as well as uh, sort of sideways. And on the very last section. Now, considering it's a kind of, you know, it's an army type game, uh, I always felt it a bit ridiculous that the last section is you are throwing knives at a dictator, you know. It just seems a bit far fetched. I know it's a video game, so video games are allowed to be far fetched, but uh, yeah, like I said, I think Beachhead. Two is probably the, the weakest out of the Beachhead and Raider and Moscow series. It just the games, although very technically impressive, I just thought that they were, you know, they weren't that great games as they stand. But anyway, listen, that is it, guys. Hope you enjoyed watching this video. Um, as usual, if there's a particular company you would like to see featured in this series, just uh, put your comments below, and I'll see what I can do. Finally, thank you very much for all your support. Please feel free to like, comment and subscribe. And finally, thank you very much for watching.